Well, we are continuing a series this morning called Repeat. Uh, if you've missed any of the installments of that, it has a basic idea or a basic concept. And that is the things that we repeat are the things that actually happen in our lives, the things that we are consistent in. And one of the ideas behind the series uh, comes from a, a marketing principle. There's this marketing principle out there called the rule of seven. And that's this idea that if I put this particular product or thing in front of people uh, at least seven times, consistently seven times, there's a better chance that not only will they see it, but that they would actually move towards it and do it or buy it or whatever it is that you're trying to get done, if that makes sense. And so taking that same kind of concept, we're, we're trying to apply that to this particular series. And, uh, and over the last uh, couple of weeks, we've been looking at certain behaviors, certain habits that we need to repeat in our lives in order to become more like Jesus. Now, it's important you understand this. At no point in this series will you hear me say that uh, I need to do stuff in order to get God to love me. I need to do stuff in order to be saved. Because, see, the Bible says that Jesus uh, came into this world, died for your sins, and then delivers to you a free gift, and all you have to do is receive it. No strings attached. It's simple. It's really that easy. And that's the thing you have to kind of separate out a little bit as we talk about this particular series. Because the series isn't so much about salvation as it is us becoming more like Jesus. And the truth is, is there are things that we need to do in our lives consistently, things that we need to repeat that will then lead to us being more like Jesus. And so over the last couple of weeks, you've heard me talk about a few things. We've talked about fasting. We've talked about how important it is that we read the word of God. We've talked about how important it is that we have the right relationships in our life. And today I want to focus in a little bit on this idea of retreating. Now, I don't know if that's a regular for you. I don't know if that's something that, that is consistent in your life, but it is absolutely critical for me to understand the importance of retreating and have it as a regular holy habit in my life if I'm ever going to be what God wants me to truly be. And so we're going to spend some time talking about that. And, and just in a general sense, uh, uh, there will be some discussion of just the idea of rest in this. Uh, and this message is really not so much about Sabbath. So, so the Bible talks about the importance of Sabbath. Now let me read that to you in Exodus 20. So, so in Exodus 20, verse 8 through 10, the Bible says to us, Moses is writing, he says, Remember to observe the Sabbath day, by keeping it holy. You have six days each week for your ordinary work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath day of rest dedicated to God. Now, like I said, I'm not going to spend a ton of time today on that, but I will next Sunday. But I want to kind of talk about a nuance to that, that, that I think sometimes we only look at Sabbath. We only look at the importance of having that in our life. But there's actually some other things that we need to be doing. There are some other retreating that we need to be doing in order to be as healthy as God wants us to be. So you get that. You understand what I'm saying. It's important you get that. And so next week I'll talk more about Sabbath. And I'll just say this about Sabbath. I think Sabbath is one of the things that Christians break the rules on the most. And we dismiss it as no big deal. It is a big deal to God. And we'll talk about that, all right? So I, you, you guys are like, oh, I'm off the hook. Whew. Next week. <laughs> Next week, all right? Next week. All right? Good, good. Here's a key thought that I want you to get today. Regular retreating and repeating creates space to, for God to speak. Regular retreating and repeating of that behavior Create space for God to speak. Most of the time when I ask somebody, do you want to hear from God? They would say to me, yes. Matter of fact, I'm not sure I've heard anybody tell me no. Uh, you know, like, I mean, who, who's really like, no, nah, I'm good. I, I really have no interest in that. But most of the time it's, yeah, I want in. I want in on that. 
And that's the thing that retreating helps us do. Retreating is something that if we will repeat this behavior in our life, we will become better equipped for that. Now, a couple of things that I've heard repeated in people's lives or people have said repeatedly are these kinds of things. I'm too busy. I don't have time. Have you noticed every week I've started with that? Have you noticed every week that's the thing I start with? Because that seems to be the number one excuse that we have in our lives. And you've heard me say this before, but this is a principle that I think is absolutely true, even though it hurts. This is a principle that squeezes us, and we don't like it, but we know it's true. And that is this simple idea that we make time for those things that are most important to us. Whether you like to admit that or not, it's true. And so it's something that we have to come to grips with when we think about our time and the fact that I'm busy and all the work and all this and that and this and that and this and that. And we've talked so often about how the enemy, one of his greatest schemes is to keep us distracted. Just if he can just get you distracted, if he can just get you busy, what happens is he begins to slowly steal everything that God wants to give you. And retreating is one of the weapons we have in our arsenal to help us see clearly. And so the things I hear repeated is, I don't have time, I'm too busy, or like this one, I don't like to be alone. You ever felt that way for all the extroverts in the room? Don't particularly enjoy that. Uh, if, you, if you're like me, uh, the idea of sitting somewhere alone for long periods of time is a little scary. I get bored. I think about like how easy it is to call somebody or like, hey, you want to come over and sit with me in silence? You know, <laughs> right? Like, the, I don't know if you're like me, but as an extrovert, it's hard for me to get alone. The idea of being holed up somewhere for multiple days all by myself is a little freaky. Now, you introverts are like, oh, I love that. That's like the greatest thing ever. And that's great. That's how God wired you. But it isn't how he wired me. And I just want to be honest about that. And so what that means is, is that, that okay, here's the principle. And my job as a follower of Christ is to adjust my life to the principle not to change the principle in order to fit my life. And that's the thing we have to see, is that God didn't come to change. He came to change me. And so he gives me the principle and says, what are you going to do with it? He recognizes that for the introvert, being in a small group might be difficult for them, right? So that's a challenge for them. But he doesn't say, don't do it. Same is true for retreating. If you're an extrovert, being alone might be a challenge for you. But he doesn't say you're off the hook. He simply says you got to press into it. Why does God make us press into the things that we don't want to press into? Why does God push us towards things that are somehow going to challenge us? Well, because when we're challenged, we can grow. But if we're never challenged in our life, if we never create space for that kind of challenge, guess what? You're not going to grow. And it's a scary thought to get to the, get like 20 years in and be like, you know, I've been doing this a long time and I, I really have not grown. And I, that, as your pastor, that is a scary thought to me. That I'd know some of you for 20 years and I'd look at you 20 years from now and you'd be the same. That would not be good. I just don't want that for your life. I don't. And so we have to understand this principle. Other things I've heard repeated and is that I can't hear from God. Like, you know, I sit, I can't hear. See, that's not true. The Bible even says that's not true. And so if you believe the Bible, the Bible says you can hear from God. And so whatever you've put into your brain that says you can't hear, you can actually hear. It's kind of like learning a new language. If you're going to learn a new language, if you're going to learn Spanish or French or some other language... You have to give yourself to that language. You have to spend time learning the language. You've got to spend time learning the rules of the language and how this verb gets conjugated and, and the female and the masculine and you know, you know all the things that are just hard sometimes about language. But you have to give yourself to it if you're ever going to understand it. 
And if you've ever been in a foreign country, you walk into a foreign country where they speak a different language, and, 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 and you feel out of place. You feel awkward. I don't know about you, but, I mean, you walk into a room and everybody's speaking a different language. You're like, ah, 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 I feel uncomfortable because I don't know the language. And that's how many of us feel about retreating. That's how many of us feel about hearing God's voice. But it's not because you can't hear God's voice. It's because you've got to put in some time. You've got to put in some time. And that is how God begins to grow us and help us. Now, I've also heard this one repeated, is I don't have the money. Look, I don't have the money to do this. And I just say to you, look, that is a bad excuse. There are lots of things you can do that are free. I mean, there really are. And matter of fact, I know a place just south of here that I can get you a night at this uh, hermitage for $40 a night. Okay, $40 a night is pretty cheap. Now, it's nothing to look at. But it's a place. And so there are spaces for us to go. There are places that I can commune with God, that I can get away. And there's other places that you can go that are out in nature. There's all kinds of things that you can do. I remember one time I was doing a retreat. I sat in my truck in a parking lot for an entire day, which is weird. I mean, isn't that weird? I didn't have no cash. So I just sat in a parking lot for the entire day, and I just spent time with the Lord. Reading my Bible, thinking, praying. It even made me feel good. I'd see people, you know, because I'm an extrovert. It was nice. To, I, I was alone, but I could still see them. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I don't know. A couple other ones. Another one I've heard repeat is I have kids. Hey, guys, I got three. I've had kids. Had kids. No, have kids. <laughs> I've had them little. I've had them medium size, and some of them are a little older now. So, I mean, I've had them in all ages, and all I just want to say to you, it, we make time for those things that are important. There are ways to do it. There are ways to get alone. There are ways to retreat. Find somebody in this church that you could do a kid swap with. You know what I mean? Trade it out. You take my kids this time, I'll take your kids. You know, do something creative to come up with ways that you can get alone with God because it matters. Because, see, when we retreat and we repeat... We're able to start to hear God better. We're able to hear him speak. When the noise of life and the chatter of life starts to go down, I can hear his voice go up. And those are the things that we have to understand. And here's the thing that the Bible very clearly teaches us, and Jesus very clearly models for us, is a behavior of consistently retreating and repeating that lifestyle. Look, look I'll show you. I mean, you don't have to believe me, but look, look in the Bible. Luke chapter 4, I'll just read two chapters of Luke, Luke chapter 5 and Luke chapter 6, a couple of verses there, just to kind of make the point. And so Jesus it says here in Luke chapter, the Bible says in Luke chapter 5 verse 16, but Jesus often withdrew to the wilderness for prayer. That's pretty straightforward. I mean, it doesn't even, said, it doesn't even say that Jesus withdrew occasionally. Jesus withdrew this one time because he was going to the cross. No, it says that he often withdrew. He often withdrew. In other words, it was a habit. It was a consistent behavior, a holy habit that he had created in his life so that he could continue to be effective on this earth. He knew that I needed to connect with my father in order to be effective here. So his connection vertically affected his horizontal impact. Get that. And so, so here, I'll just read another one to you in Luke chapter 6, verse 12. One day, soon afterwards, Jesus went up on a mountain to pray, and he prayed to God all night. Now Jesus just showing off, isn't he? Prayed all night? That's not easy to do. But here's the thing. He probably didn't just start there. I think sometimes we got to understand that, that it's a process. The idea of praying all night for some of us is like, I'm out. I don't have any interest in that. You know? And I get that. That's why you got to start. You got to start somewhere. And God will begin to help you. God will begin to invest in that relationship at such a level that, man, if you knew you'd hear from God, 
you'd show up. Think about that. I always, I always say this, is, is, is if, if we knew that prayer worked, we'd pray more. Right? So if I knew that I had an appointment with God on my calendar and I knew that I was going to meet with him and he was going to speak to me, I'd show up. I'd make it a priority. And so the thing that we have to understand is, is that it's part of our thinking that keeps us from experiencing all that God has. To, of, of exploring that relationship further. It's the thinking that we have. And the thinking is, oh, man, I'm going to be bored. Oh, man, he's not going to say nothing. I'm just going to sit in a room and, and stare at a, a weird painting that's on a hotel room. <laughs> that every room has. It's the same painting. You know what I'm saying? I don't know what you think about, but these are the things that sometimes I think about. But if I came at it from, I know that God will talk to me. I know that God will answer a prayer. I know that God will meet me. Whew. Now, all of a sudden, I'm interested. And then I'd say this. If you're not interested, then something's wrong. You get that? I mean, if you're not interested in that, something's wrong. Then the first part, go back to, you know how they say, go back to go? Then the first part, something didn't happen right. The idea of being saved. The idea of being face to face with a God who loves you. The idea that he sent his son into this world to die for you that you did not at all deserve. Like if that doesn't move you, then we need to go back to go. And we need to look at that. We need to understand that. Because if I have been saved, there is something in me that's motivated to be with a God like that. Motivated to be with a God that loves me in that kind of way. And so we have to strategically withdraw in order to keep a particular rhythm in our life so that we can hear from God. It's like music, right? If you've ever heard music that was out of rhythm, isn't that fun? Right? Like you're just sitting there like... And that's how some of you clap. I, I've heard you in worship. Like if in, that, in worship, if I turned the volume down right when y'all were singing... Like some of you would be so off, but that's why we keep the volume loud so we don't have to hear you. But can you imagine the rhythm being off and how it's just clunky? And some of our spiritual lives are clunky. We don't have rhythm. And the reason we don't have rhythm is because we don't spend any time with God retreating and repeating and hearing so that we can get a rhythm with God, so that we can get a flow with God that's natural. It's not clunky. It's fun. It's exciting. It's joyful. It's, you, you see what I'm getting at? And that's the kind of rhythm that we all need. And we get it from regularly withdrawing and repeating that behavior so that we can consistently hear from God. And so Jesus understood this. Matter of fact, Jesus understood how important this was, and he also understood the benefits. Jesus understood the benefits. That's what I love about being a follower of Jesus, is that it's not just about my salvation. There are all kinds of also, there are all kinds of benefits that come along with my salvation that I need to grab hold of as Christians. And the thing I've learned is that it seems like more and more Christians are living subpar. They're living lives that are below God's best. It's like he says, here, take it. And you're like, no, nah, I'm good. But why would we do that? If there are benefits that come with the relationship, why not receive every one of them? Why not be like, I'll take it all, God. Fill my cup to overflowing with the benefits of knowing you. Now, my motivation isn't to get the benefits. My motivation is the relationship but a byproduct of the relationship are these benefits. And that's what Jesus knew. And so here's just a couple of things I want to share with you about the, the retreating benefits that we receive. And I want to start here in Jeremiah, Jeremiah 29, 13. You may know Jeremiah 29, 11, because it's the one that says, for God knows the plans he has for you, right? The plans to prosper you and give you, you know, a future and all that stuff. Maybe you've memorized that. But right after that, in verse 13, there's this powerful verse in Jeremiah, and the prophet says it this way. He says, if you look to me wholeheartedly. What does it say? You will find me. Yeah. Promise to you. 
If you look for him, you will find him. If you retreat and repeat with an expectation of meeting with God, the Bible says you will find him. That's good news. That's, the, that's what we all want. That is one of the major benefits of being alone with God, of pulling away from the busyness of the world, is that I get to meet with God. I get to meet with a God that loves me. I get to meet with a God that has all the answers for me. I get to meet with a God that knows his will and purpose for my life. I don't have to wander around in the dark clawing and wondering. And he's like, no, 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 just meet with me and you will hear and you will see and you will know what the next step is. That's what God wants you to understand. Whoo-wee. Yeah, it's good. See, when we retreat and repeat, we can create the space for God to speak. And also, a couple of other benefits. Number one, it helps us recognize His voice. When we are alone consistently with God, we start to better understand His voice. Because we're reading the Word and we're, we're processing that at a deeper level. Listen to what John 10 says. John 10, 4 through 5. Jesus is speaking. And he's talking to his disciples. And this is what he says. He says, after he gathered his own flock, he walked ahead of them and they followed him because they know, they know his voice. Verse five, he gives the contrast and he says, they won't follow a stranger. They will run from him because they don't know his voice. In other words, the disciple or the sheep has been able to distinguish the difference between God's voice and the voice of the world. Has been able to distinguish God's voice and the voice of the enemy. When you are a disciple of Jesus Christ who spend regular time repeating and retreating, you start to hear his voice better and discern that voice. And here's the thing. There's no shortcuts. Right? Like, I don't know about you, but I, we live in a microwave world. We want everything fast. And I get that. I do too. Like, I love microwaves. Those things are the greatest things ever. Put those things in, radiation all over the place. Let's just eat it. But it's hot, right? We love that. I mean, who wants to wait for the crock pot? Right? It's like, who wants to do that? Let's just go out. No one wants to do that. And I get that. Like, I love that. I love that kind of speed in my life. But, but I also know this. God doesn't work that way. God is not in a hurry. He's not. He never has been. That's why, like, when we pray, we're like, God, do something, do something, do something. He's like, I will. On my time. Like it can be God's will, but not his time. Like you can experience, like he knows, like he has given you a promise. It is his will for your life, but it's not his timing. And we get to a point where we're like, well, God, you have to move. And he's like, no, I don't. (laughs) I don't, because he's not always concerned about that. Because see, God's more concerned about the relationship. And it's hard to have a good relationship without putting time in. It just is. You can't you can't microwave a relationship. And if you do, you're not. I was going to say you're dumb, but I won't say that. (laughs) I didn't say it. I I took it back. Do you see what I did? (laughs) You can't. It takes time in. That's how we develop it. There's no substitute. There's no microwave. It's a consistent Daily obedience in the same direction. That's it. And that's the part that's hard. Because we want it. When my wife calls me, I know her voice. Right? I mean, and if I don't, that's a problem. (laughs) I know her voice, I know her inflection. I know her tones. Uh, I've known her long enough now that if 70% of communication is body language, 
I've gotten to a point where I know her voice now that I can kind of figure out her body language based on the tone of her voice. Does that make sense? So I'm, I'm able to... I'm able, to, I'm, I'm able to discern that on the other end. And it's because I've spent time there. It's because I've got to know her. It's because I understand her voice and I get it and I've invested and I'm listening and I'm learning and I'm growing and as a husband. And you get what I'm saying. That's the same kind of thing. You know, like in literature, when they say someone was writing and it sounds that like someone wrote something and they're like, that doesn't sound like that person's voice. It, 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 like literature people, they'll like they'll 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 be reading like maybe a document that they think is suspect, and they'll read it and they're like, that doesn't sound like that person's voice. And it's because they're so familiar with the voice that they're able to discern that that particular writing is not the same voice. There's something wrong with that. Yeah. And so that's the kind of thing that we're looking for is that I, I am so connected and so removed sometimes from the situation that I can hear him and I can discern it and I know it and it's so clear to me. That's one of the benefits of being away. That's one of the benefits of retreating. Number two is it helps us rest. How many of us need to rest? How many of us are moving at such a speed that we just can't see straight? We don't have margin. We don't ever have any time. We're always so busy, right? And I get it. And you, I've, I've told you it's the president rule. Like I always use the president rule. Like you think you're busy, but how busy do you think the president is? You know what I'm getting at? Like he's really busy. He like has meetings probably in like 10 minute increments. You know what I mean? You got 10 minute increment meetings? And my point is, is that we can be really busy, but I know that there were presidents that were really busy and they found time to spend with God. And so my point is, is that we can't use that as an excuse. We have to readjust so that we can rest. And the thing about creating consistent retreating is it forces you into a time of rest to sit, be still and know that I am God. If I don't ever slow down, if I don't ever get still, listen to this in Psalm 116, 7, let my soul be at rest again. For the Lord has been good to me. In other words, I need to be still. I need to rest. And what happens in the moment that I do that, the moment I slow down, the moment I create space, the moment I create margin, is I get that reminder again of how good he is and how he's working behind the scenes for me. And all the things I'm worried and anxious about, all the things that I've given my time and energy to, he reminds me again. He says, hey, 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 you need to relax. You need to slow down. You need to be still. And in that moment, God will meet me there, and he'll remind me again that he's more than enough, that this problem I have, that he's bigger than it, that my God is always bigger than my problem. You get it? And when we're there, we, we, we we're able to consistently rest. And then I finally end with this. This is one of the last benefits I'll give you. Number three is it helps us to remember. It helps us to remember. Listen to this particular chapter in Psalm. In the Psalms 103, Psalm 103, verses 1 through 5. I'll just read it to you. And I just want you to grasp the language of this psalm. Okay? Just, I mean, I just want you to grab a hold of it. Listen to, listen to this. Let all that I am praise the Lord. With my whole heart, not a divided heart, with a whole heart, I will praise his holy name. Verse 2, let all that I am praise the Lord. Did you see the repetition? And so he starts with praise and he says, look, I'm going to praise. I should praise. That should be regular in my life. Why should I praise? Why should I speak to God praise with a whole heart? Well, he explains it. Look at this. May I never forget the good things he has done for me. Some translations say, may I never forget the benefit. May I never forget the benefit. And then he goes into this list. If you're looking for a list of benefits, come on. He says, he forgives all my sins. 
He heals all my diseases. He redeems me from death and crowns me with love and tender mercies. He fills my life with good things. And he says, the, the, my youth is renewed like the eagles. I praise because of these things. I don't praise because my circumstances are always good. If I am waiting to praise God until my circumstances get good, then I may be waiting a while. Because this world has troubles, friends. We have troubles. Matter of fact, you probably have trouble every day. And if you let trouble keep you from the one, that's the problem. You got to push through it. You got to say no. I get it. This is, you're not, you're not like an ostrich just putting your head in the sand and being like, well, everything's good, even though my arm just fell off. No, you acknowledge my arm just fell off. That's horrible. But God is still good. God is still working. God is still working on my behalf. And that's the thing that we have to see, is that when we retreat and repeat, we get to see his goodness again. We get to see what he's done for us. We get to see that he's our forgiver. He's our healer. He's our redeemer. He's the one that crowns us. He's the one that fills us. He's the one that renews us. See, that's the God we serve. And when we see that clearly, all we have to do is go, yeah! Because see, I praise him because of how good he is. And you may be in a hole right now, but I guarantee you, you can levitate out of that hole if you'll get some praise going in your life. If you start to praise him, if you start to worship him, if you start to just lift his name high, put on a worship CD and worship your way out of that worry, out of that fear, out of that anxiety. Keep pressing, keep pressing, knowing that he's on the other side of it. And so when we retreat, we can see again, we can hear, and we can remember all that he's done for us. All that he's done for us. Let's pray. God, I thank you. I thank you for your word today. I thank you that you're reminding us again of what it looks like to hang out with you, of what it looks like to fellowship with you. God, I thank you that in your word, you say that we can meet with you. And so God, right now, some of us in this room are just holding on. We have had a hard week. We have had a hard year. And there is a part of us that just wants to curl up in a ball. We want to give up. Some of us are struggling because, I mean, we're even struggling to believe that you're good anymore. God, I pray right now that you would meet people right now. Just begin to speak to them. Just begin to receive Psalm 103 in your life. That as you praise him, as you begin to remember the benefits, all of a sudden he's going to start downloading his heart. You're going to experience his presence right now. God, would you fall afresh on your people? Right now, Jesus, would you come? Holy Spirit, would you begin to move in this room? Would you get, just begin to refresh some hearts today? Remind them again of how good you are. Remind them again of how faithful you are. God, I pray just for an outpouring of your spirit in this room. If that's something you need, just say, Lord, I need it. I need to be refreshed today. I need to be renewed and filled. I need you. I need you, God. Just tell him. Say, God, I need you. I pray by the power of the Holy Spirit that you would be filled with his presence. You'd be filled with his power. You'd walk out of here renewed again, remembering how good he is and how he's working behind the scenes in your life. Our
Earlier I mentioned how sometimes we maybe have been doing the religious thing, you know? Maybe we've been coming to church and doing all the right things, but there's no passion. There's no desire in our lives to be with God. And I talked about how we need to go back to go. We need to go back to the beginning. Because the Bible says that Jesus gave all for me. That he gave his life for me. That he surrendered his life for me. He sacrificed his life. That in that moment, as I look on the cross of Jesus Christ, I come face to face with his tangible, sacrificial love for me. Just look at it in your eye, in your mind's eye. Just look. It's on that cross that we should be moved by that sacrifice. And today, I just want to invite you to take hold of that. The Bible says that if you would confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that this is true, that you would put your faith and trust in Jesus today, that he will come in. And he will not only save you, but he will begin the work of transforming you. And so with your heads bowed and eyes closed today, I just want to give you that chance to respond. And so as a way that we do here around here, is, with heads bowed and eyes closed, I just want to ask you to raise your hand on the count of three as a way of indicating your desire to grab hold of what Jesus has done for you. And so right now on the count of three, if you want to do that, I want to pray for you. Just go ahead on three, just to lift up your hand boldly. One, two, three. Go ahead. God bless you. Good, good, good. See your hands. Good. That's awesome. Awesome. Anybody else? All right. Go ahead and put your hands down. Church, we're all going to pray together here. Nobody's praying alone in here. We're one big family praying. And so, if you did raise your hand, I'd love for you to repeat this prayer with me. So church, let's pray. Lord Jesus, I need you. Will you forgive me of my sins? Will you wash me clean? I believe. I surrender. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Change me from the inside out. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Can we just celebrate all that God is doing? Come on. It's so good. Amen, amen. Awesome, awesome.